I'm James Foster, co-director of the Institute for International Economic Policy, or IIEP as we call it, at the George Washington University, welcoming you to our conversation today with Harsha Singh, uh, former deputy director of the WTO on India's trade policy, past, present, future. Thank you, Harsha, for giving us the benefit of your tremendous experience in the art and science of international trade. We are also joined today by a remarkable panel of discussants, commencing with Rajiv Kerr, whose extensive career culminated in service as Secretary of Commerce for India. He will be followed by trade economist, Judy Dean, formerly of the USITC and currently at Brandeis. But I met her a few years earlier as her TA in PhD micro at Cornell, a class which also contained such notables as Shubhashish Gangopadhyay, Debraj Ray, Haider Ali Khan, and GW's economics chair, Stephen Smith. And finally, we are joined by Dean Alyssa Ayers of the Elliott School, a scholar of South Asia with significant experience in the region, including major experience as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State. Thank you all for taking the time out of your busy schedules to be here today. In just a moment, series organizer Ajay Chibber, who is a distinguished visiting scholar at IEP, will set the stage and formally introduce our guests. But first, I'd like to reach out to the many in the audience who have been affected and continue to be affected by the pandemic in our midst. You're in our thoughts and prayers as we hope for a better time when our family group chats are not filled with countless personal tragedies. Our event today is co-sponsored by the Seeger Center for Asian Studies in the Elliott School. I'd like to thank them and also IIP's new executive circle and especially co-chairs Frank Wong and Deborah Lair for their continued support. Now, for those of you who haven't attended a previous IAP event, you can expect a nonpartisan, lively, and informative conversation on such topics as US-China economic relations, multidimensional poverty, climate change, and digital trade. Next week on June 9th, IAP presents a half-day conference jointly with our World Bank neighbors entitled The Spatial Economic Effects of Conflict. Check out the all-star lineup, including economics professor Remy Jadwab of the Elliott School. On the 21st, our Facing Inequality series invites Georgetown to George Washington, when government and SFS professor Marco Klosnia discusses some uncomfortable truths about the wealth of politicians. And later that same week, our Rethinking Capitalism and Democracy series will bring another neighbor to campus, Nicoletta Battini of the IMF discussing sustainable food systems and the environment. Today's episode of Envisioning India is the final one of this year's series. Our previous Envisioning India episode featured environmentalist and activist Sunita Narayan discussing the twin challenges to India presented by the environment and COVID-19. Check out the video or that of any of our events on our YouTube channel, IIEPGW. Now, let me turn the podium over to my distinguished colleague, Ajay Chibber. Professor. Thank you very much, uh, uh, James, it's, and welcome to all of you. Um, this is the 10th uh, event uh, of our Envisioning India series this year. And it's, uh, it's probably, I think this is the last one we will do this academic year uh, for, so this is, uh, fitting that we have such a tre uh, tremendously distinguished uh, group for this last one for this academic year. We'll probably restart again in September, but that will be uh, a new series for 21, 22. Uh, and as James has said, there, there's been nine of them before and they've been great ones. So it, the videos are all available and you're welcome to see them. But today we have a treat for you. Uh, we have uh, a India, trade policy, past, present, and future. Well, the past we know a little bit about. We were a closed economy, and then we became an open economy uh, until recently. And, and so the present is a little bit confusing at the moment. We are turning inwards. 
although the government keeps professing we are not. So today, I think we'll be all that will be revealed today to us uh, by this uh, great uh, list of speakers to us. And who knows what the future holds, but I'm sure we'll get some uh, predictions for that as well. I usually uh, compare kind of when I, I'm not a net trade expert, but I think of it in, in cricketing terms that when I was a young boy and Harsh and I and Rajiv would remember, India used to lose, uh, would win at home, but lose abroad on cricket. Uh, but it didn't turn inwards. It actually went out and played and played and became a great cricketing power now and can win abroad as well. So I always think, well, you know, why can't we do that for our trade as well? So I think that that's how I look at trade. But, uh, you know, the experts will tell us today. We have a very distinguished group. James has already um, said a bit about them, but let me just add that uh, uh, Dean Alicia Ayers is, is a very distinguished uh, scholar of trade and international relations. Her book, Our Time Has Come, uh, has won many awards, was listed in the FT uh, as a book worth reading, of course, in, uh, and she has also been a practitioner. She has been Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for South Asia from 2010 to 2013. And then, of course, uh, for the last seven, eight years, she's been the Senior Fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. So she has had an extremely distinguished career. She's, I know she speaks Hindi and Urdu as well. And so a uh, very warm welcome to you, uh, to Alicia, to, and also uh, but now as the new dean at the Elliott School. We have Rajiv Kerr. He's probably been India's most distinguished Commerce Secretary, which is the highest position in the Commerce Ministry. He has had innumerable negotiations on the w, at the WTO, and on GATT, on, on a whole range of uh, trade deals. Um, other than uh, trade, he's also very well versed on environmental issues. He served at Terry, the famous institute in India. Uh, and he has uh, many other very distinguished, uh, um, you know, uh, things that he has done that I won't, uh, you can read it all, uh, all up on his CV. We have Professor Judy Dean. She's from Brandeis University, of course, a classmate of James, as, as he has already said. What is very interesting about her is that she has done a lot of work on China and trade and on GVCs, but lately she has turned her attention, fortunately for us, on India, and particularly on trade and poverty-related issues, which are, I think, very, very important. So welcome to you, Professor Dean. And then last but not least, let me turn to our speaker, uh, Harsh Vardhan Singh, who's, as James said, been DDD. DDG at WTO. He was also the secretary of the Telecom Regulatory Authority of India. He was executive director for Brookings India. And when I knew him from college, he was a great basketball player and became a Rhodes Scholar and then went to Oxford and got a PhD at Oxford. He's probably in my mind, one of the best trade economists we have in India. So over to you, uh, Harsh. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ajay. It's a, both a privilege and a, and a great pleasure to be on this forum. And uh, the pleasure and privilege are increased when I, I see the uh, persons who are part of the uh, experts who will comment on the issues, as well as those who are participating, including several friends uh, whom I have worked with, one of them has been my boss also, and a very close friend now. Uh, there you are, Rakesh. <laughs> so, uh, hi. Uh, so, uh, I'll just, uh, with, with these words, I'll, I'll go on to uh, my presentation. So, basically, in order to understand what uh, India is trying to achieve through its trade policy, uh, it's, it's trade deficit concern about the large uh, trade deficit it has recorded over several years. And also 
the high uh, in in uh, according to the pers perspective of uh, the planners the very high merchandise imports uh, and the combination is worrying to them also when they they project the next five years or 10 years down the line and see the increase in middle class and and demand especially for certain products which uh, will uh, have a very large market in 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 uh, india so with that background we have to see how india has done in the past its gdp growth performance has been good GDP global ranking is uh, actually higher than that of its ranking in merchandise exports. But merchandise exports did grow very rapidly during the uh, first uh, decade of this year. Uh, and also uh, in the 1990s, there, there was growth, but first decade was, was quite rapid. But right now, they appear to be stuck. So I'm now going to the next page. So if you see GDP ranking of India from 13th in 1980, it came down to uh, number five in 2019 and went back because of COVID to uh, uh, number six. Next slide. This is the global ranking of India in merchandise exports and imports. So I've taken 1980 as a cutoff point so that you can uh, you know, compare the decade before 1991 also. So you see the merchandise exports ranking increasing, but the real shift came uh, from 2000 to 2010, actually 2011. And then if you see the ranking, it's more or less stuck. The, the share of India's merchandise exports in total world exports has been stuck around 1.6, 1.7% since then. Our imports have increased a bit, but uh, again, uh, 2020 was not a good year. But the main problem in the minds of the, uh, the policymaker is how to increase exports and since trade deficit is also a concern, they want to also try and see how to keep trade deficit down, not only by increasing exports, uh, but reducing imports. So with this in, in your mind, you can, uh, you can uh, understand the efforts much, much better. Commercial services also, India has done better. In fact, India's uh, performance is much better in commercial services. I won't spend very much time on this because the picture is similar. If you see the ratio of exports of goods and services to GDP and uh, a ratio of trade, you will, you will see both the fact that the, the uh, share of imports was much higher. And as far as exports are concerned, Again, uh, there was an increase in uh, goods and services exports to GDP up till about 2010, 2011. And after that, the, the increase has more or less matched the GDP growth. Yeah. Um, yeah. You may want to tell uh, Carmela whenever you want to move the slides. Yeah, so I'm now going to the next slide, which is ratio of trade balance and current account balance to GDP. Yes. This slide actually explains to you the concern about the trade balance, which I talked about. Look at the numbers from 2005, 2006. And so next, next slide, I think, Carmela. Yeah. So you can see 2005, 2006 minus 6.2. And uh, since then, it's uh, uh, really been in, in, uh, at, at very high ratio compared to what the planners would be or uh, policymaker would be comfortable with. As Ajay said, next slide, Carmela. So I first uh, address tariffs. As Ajay said, that we had very high tariffs uh, up to 1991. And after that, we have seen a sharp decrease. 
Nonetheless, if you compare with India's competitive economies, India's MFN tariffs remain very high. And this issue is further uh, kind of uh, illustrated uh, in, in the, the, the level of tariffs from the fact that the ratio of some of the competing economies uh, of imports subject to MFN is very low compared to India's such ratio. I, uh, I'm, I'm looking at certain sectors in, in India right now, and it's amazing how much the discrepancy is. That's because India hasn't been part of some uh, uh, several FTAs, which the competing economies are part of. Therefore, the actual tariff, which applies is much lower. And weighted average tariffs is much lower than simple average, which is to be expected because you import, uh, uh, you're likely to import more at, at lower tariffs. But uh, the, the discrepancy between the two is very, very large. Uh, and it's the, the, a rough uh, alternate estimate, which I'll share with you later, shows that it's much lower than the, the usual weighted average tariff uh, estimates we get from some of the organizations which, which provide us with such information. Uh, another Im implication of uh, high MFN tariffs is that it makes it very difficult to nego negotiate FTAs. So with this in mind, now this is a, is, is a picture of how the tariffs have decreased. And this is uh, a simple average tariff, uh, uh, applied tariff. Uh, so you can see that from 125. Next, next slide, I think. Yeah. Next slide, next slide. Sorry, sorry. I should have told Carmela. You can see that uh, from 125, uh, the uh, tariff average is down to, or was down in the middle of last decade, around 13%. Another thing which, which you'll see is that Manufacturing had higher tariffs than agriculture in the initial years. And this has flipped now uh, since 2010-11. I'll, I'll now uh, go to the next slide, Carmela. These are more recent times. So you can see that the agriculture average MFN tariffs are much higher than those of non-agriculture. And compared to 2005, uh, the tariffs were reduced further, and they, they stayed in the range of about 12 to 13 to sometimes close to 14 percent. But a big change occurred in 2018. Incidentally, 2018 was the first budget of the government of India where the finance minister actually said explicitly that I'm introducing a change in strategy for tariff policy. From now onwards, I will raise tariffs to encourage uh, infant industries. So 2018 is a watershed uh, year uh, in that context. And you can, you can see tariffs rising for both uh, non-agriculture and agriculture, and the average tariffs are now about 18%. Next slide, Carmela. I, I told you uh, about the major difference between uh, uh, weighted average tariffs and uh, the simple average uh, applied tariffs, which uh, estimates. So here, the, the second column, gives you the ratio of basic customs duty revenue to merchandise imports. This is a, a rough estimate of weighted average tariffs. This is far lower than the kind of estimates you, you come across of weighted average tariffs. Uh, and uh, earlier, uh, the indirect tax revenue was uh, on, uh, in, 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 indirect tax imposed on, on imports was also uh, added on to the custom revenue, but uh, from after the GST coming into place, you, you can see that uh, the uh, 
the uh, ratio of custom duty revenue to merchandise imports has been uh, you know about three to four percent it's it's slightly more than four percent uh, last year now one of the questions next slide next slide uh, Karmal. one of the questions which a lot of people have been thinking about is uh, India negotiating the RCEP FTA and at the last minute deciding not to join it. This has a lot to do with the high tariffs or MFN tariffs which, which prevail. It has a lot to do with the dominant presence of China. It has a lot to do with the perception of China not using uh, certain policies which are transparent, which give undue advantages to state trading uh, enterprises uh, or and even others uh, with uh, uh, you know opaque subsidy schemes and and uh, uh, and other support policies so india was very keen to uh, have some kind of a safeguard trigger against imports from china this was in concept similar to special safeguard mechanism which was negotiated in agriculture by India uh, during the Doha round. Uh, uh, that is in, in limbo right now. And the second thing is, you'll see that tariffs of uh, in India increased from 2014, and they are much higher in 2019. Uh, so uh, the RCEP countries wanted the tariffs to decrease from 2014 levels, but India wanted the uh, year from which tariffs would go down is 2019, giving it some respite. There were some other aspects also like rules of origin. It, basically it is circumvention by China and the aggregation of rules of origin would, would make it, uh, uh, even if you have a safeguard, it, it could make it very difficult to at least uh, have adequate protection against uh, the Chinese exports. Uh, trade and services and and more credible mechanisms for addressing non-tariff measures because India feels that its exports are not able to increase as much as the potential because of the non-tariff barriers which are used, used by uh, its major export markets. Uh, Carmela, the next, next slide, please. So here you can see the difficulty which India faced. India's uh, simple average tariff uh, MFN tariff was 17.6 percent, and the these are the current members of RCEP. The highest uh, total tariff uh, average uh, was Korea, which was 13.6. All the rest, uh, other than Thailand, are below 10 percent. And on non-agriculture products, India's uh, average tariff was 14.1 percent, while all the RCEP members have much lower tariffs. You can see there's no country with uh, uh, even 10% uh, average. Next slide, Karman. And here is the worry which, uh, actually this typifies India's larger concern also, and it links up with the trade deficit, which I mentioned. So these are some of the countries uh, who uh, are members of RCEP. And uh, if, if you take a look at India's uh, trade with these countries in 2019-20, uh, it's particularly uh, important to see uh, the deficit with China, where if, 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 you, if you basically see that, uh, compare it with the total deficit, a very large portion. In fact, if you were filing uh, on, based on this kind of an assessment, if you're filing an anti-dumping complaint, you would be representing with that ratio uh, uh, a, a major part of major part of uh, uh, the domestic industry. You'd be representing the domestic industry itself as a as a valid complainant. The other concern of India was dairy products, a very politically charged uh, uh, situation, and. Uh, for Australia, you can you can see there's also quite quite a large deficit. So these were were some of the main concerns, and these numbers illustrate that that worry. Next next slide. 
Now, what India is, is doing right now is in some sense, uh, uh, India has adopted a, uh, uh, an industrial policy where it wants to encourage FDI inflows, get both uh, foreign savings, foreign technology operating within the country so that the domestic production goes higher. And that India is hoping will also transfer technology, uh, skills, and build the ecosystem uh, eventually link, uh, uh, providing a better possibility of linking up with global value chains. So FDI inflows and foreign exchange reserves, which becomes the other uh, criteria which people use for, for BOP concerns, uh, which India had quite uh, some years ago, but right now it's quite comfortable there. So let's go to the next slide. If you, if you see, again, the FDI inflows have increased very substantially, and the stock has increased a lot. Let's go to the next slide. Foreign exchange reserves also. India, from a very poor uh, situation in 1990-91, is today in a comfortable situation. Next slide, please. So the non-tariff measures, India, again, has liberalized a lot. Uh, it was a very complex, even opaque scheme earlier. Next slide, please. Okay, now these are some of the, uh, the measures of incidence of NTM, uh, NTMs. Uh, percentage of imported products to which NTMs apply, percentage of trade subject to NTMs, frequency index and coverage index. You can see that compared to these countries, India actually is not very high. They are much higher than India. So India is a country with high tariffs, but relatively low NTMs. Next, next slide, please. But if you compare India's uh, efforts at facilitation, because India is trying to facilitate a lot, and in some sense, what this number gives uh, in terms of non-tariff measures at the border, the overall application or incidence of non-tariff measures is governed by how you implement the regime, which India is now beginning to implement uh, more strictly with, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, resulting in, in the NTM regime with the same uh, incidence, having a much larger effective incidence, plus the, the ease with which you can, you can conduct your business uh, in terms of operational conditions. And that's where trade facilitation index is very important. So what I've tried to do here is to try and compare India, taking the OECD trade facilitation index with some economies with which it is going to complete, uh, compete, it does compete with them. And there we see that in a few contexts, India is actually is ranked very highly, but it's ranked very low, and that's where I put it as, as, as uh, in red. Uh, advanced rulings, fees and charges, involvement of trade community, documents. It ranks very low uh, compared to these economies. This doesn't mean India is not making a, a next, next slide, please. So uh, this slide you'll see uh, is, uh, uh, what I've done is I compared 2017 and 2019. And in a lot of areas, India has actually improved. And India is focusing a lot. So in future, uh, if it does not, uh, if the current uh, focus on, you know, uh, providing a more protected market uh, to the domestic producers does not continue with the same intensity, I think on, on facilitation, India will continue to do well. So this India is, is in a situation where India has high protection at the border, but India is trying to make a very special effort inside, inside the border, and it's doing quite well in, uh, and progressing well in that area. Next slide, please. 
Service restrictedness situation is improving, but still several areas of concern. Uh, next slide, please. And this actually uh, is a comparison with, with certain uh, developing economies, China, uh, where uh, if I take the services trade restrictive index, India is number one or number two in these sectors. India has a longer way to go in these areas. Next slide, please. So as I said, India has a relatively high tariff regime, low non-tariff measures, but incidence is rising. Facilitation, FDI, it's making efforts, it's uh, in improving. FTA engagement, I don't see very easy, precisely because of the inward looking uh, policy, which uh, now have come up, plus the, the MFN uh, pipe, MFN tariffs. Uh, but India has started, India has uh, had, uh, uh, did an assessment of policies which have helped some other competing economies do much better in, in, in global markets compared to them. And it, uh, one of the implications, of course, was uh, better e ease of doing business, but that they had very well-structured subsidy schemes. So India has come out with what it calls uh, production-linked incentive subsidy schemes. It has, it has uh, uh, announced it for, for several sectors, about 12, 13 of them, with a very large coverage. Uh, in that context, India's concern is how to increase the domestic activity. So from its perspective, India, the policymaker feels that with increasing tariffs, it will give a further incentive to foreign investment to come, given in their perception of India's market being a large market. Uh, this is a perception which, when you look at various sectors, is not correct across the board. In some, some products, it is correct. India's domestic market is large, but in a large number of products, uh, including uh, number which India emphasizes, uh, the global market is much larger. And when uh, major FDI global firms come, they come not just with the domestic market in place, but the global market. Vietnam is an example. But, uh, but uh, in addition to creating uh, conditions or requirements for, uh, for focusing on the domestic market through tariffs, which incidentally erodes the effective uh, subsidy, which is available to the beneficiary of the subsidy schemes because of the rise in, in uh, input cost and de decrease in efficiency. Uh, India is also emphasizing domestic value addition. And through this, its aim is to connect with global value chains. However, when you try and want to connect with global value chains, you must also think in terms of the sectors which go into this chain, plus the policies, in some sense, a policy chain. I think that is something which, where India still has some way to go uh, and trade deficit remains a concern. Next, next slide, please. Uh, COVID has changed the perception of several countries regarding trade investment policies, et cetera. There is an emphasis on reducing operational risks. And again, like India's uh, uh, decision on RCEP, a lot of this has to do with the large presence of China in, uh, in the value chains. And which, which means that if you rely on one country uh, for a, a large part of your value chain, then the extent of risk you expose your, yourself to under uncertain situations is very large. So the response has been to increase domestic production, bring manufacturing at home, improve resilience of supply chains, choose some strategic sectors and support them. In that context, choose and support priority sectors, provide subsidies, focus on new technologies, because in a lot of these so-called priority sectors, there is uh, uh, a likely change in competitiveness situation coming up because of change in technology. And that is combined with 
the widespread use of digital technology. So digital becomes a very important area also. And in that context, uh, that's a larger uh, discussion, but uh, there are certain policies which reflect the factors which I've been emphasizing till now for India. Uh, the focus is on facilitating uh, simplifying operational uh, conditions. Uh, much more emphasis on security concerns in screening FDI. This was one of the dominant reasons for policy intervention in the last year and a half in most countries of the world. And also developing international coalitions or uh, like-minded groups of countries to promote common goals. Next slide, please. So uh, if we look towards the future, say the next five years or so, US-China trade and technology related tensions are likely to remain. Uh, even if the, the pressure for continuing to, to increase tariffs may not be there under the new administration, it's very unlikely that there'll be a, a, a major downward slide in these tariffs. So trade barriers uh, will likely uh, change bro broadly unchanged, except for EU-US bilateral trade. One important change because of the change in administration is that the extent of uncertainty has, has, has reduced. And that will give some boost to global trade. And uh, in addition to the fact that after COVID, global trade is expected to rise, trade within Asia will play a very important role. Several countries will focus on FTAs, not as much India, I, I feel, which means that they will start, they will keep uh, uh, carving out parts of global markets to which India will not have equally preferential access. In the WTO, the appeal process is likely to revive, which will help countries uh, stabilize the uh, trade relationships. However, the, the, the WTO system is likely to become far more fragmented Therefore, the so-called multilateral trading system is going to, again, be broken down into coalition of countries or groups of countries following different disciplines in the areas in which they will reach some what is called plurilateral uh, agreement. And the new technology, including digital plus M, uh, uh, M2M and uh, 3D printing, will make trade regulation extremely difficult. It will make uh, rules of origin more and more uh, uncertain, opaque. Uh, it's already started uh, to happen in the, the uh, financial market, et cetera, where one doesn't know where the product is from. Uh, this will happen much more in the goods market. So the global trade scenario will become more and more uh, uncertain in, uh, in terms of the regulatory streams, but at the same time, the trade tensions are likely to decrease and coalitions are likely to increase. Next, next slide, please. So tariffs are likely to remain high in India. Non-tariff measures, there has been an inverse U, U curve, but I, I feel that after a couple of years or so, the, uh, 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 the non-tariff measures will become more permissive as India realizes the value of keeping uh, facilitation at the border uh, in, in line with facilitation inside the border uh, and facilitation will continue to be emphasized. There's one view which is gaining ground, which is that though you increase tariffs, you don't do it for uh, beyond a particular period. So let it be time bound. Uh, one example of this was the phase manufacturing policy scheme for electronics, uh, uh, where actually there is a time limit to that. I don't know if that will be uh, applied to the general tariff increases which have taken place, but over time, I feel if that is not done, India's competitiveness will decrease. Uh, more and more reliance on subsidy policy will, will come in and that won't be very easy with the fiscal constraints. FDI will remain a focus and 
it's easier to uh, focus on on uh, uh, in, inside the border uh, trade policies, and that will continue. Next, please. Trade negotiations. I though India is beginning to negotiate with the EU, it will be a difficult negotiation. But if some strategic ways are found to make both sides uh, incrementally, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, have a transition period with uh, different combinations of soft and and hard laws, kind of thing, these trade agreements can actually come into being both with the EU and with the US. Uh, and the, the way to, to look at this is to have an innovative safeguard mechanism. And US has, has done that a lot in its own trade agreements, including in TPP with, with Japan, which it ultimately got out of, but it had negotiated some very innovative safeguard mechanisms. Uh, it's much la a larger likelihood for the regulatory agreements and cooperation and uh, uh, this can happen through uh, government to government, uh, 1.5, track two, and through the new coalitions which are emerging. When this is brought together with efforts of, of those who want to invest in India and uh, do want policy to change in a way that GVC links will be, will be uh, far more easy, uh, I think solutions will come, but they will come piecemeal. I don't think a large change is going to come place in the, in the next five years or so. Next, next slide, please. Armela, the next slide, please. Yeah. So with that, I end, end my, my presentation. Thank you very much. Right. Well, thank you so much. Uh... Arsha, that was that was wonderful. What a what a tour de force of the trade history, trade present, potential future for India. So we will turn it over to Rajiv Kerr, who will provide our first discuss, discussing um, uh, event. Please, Rajiv. Thank you, Professor Foster. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's indeed a privilege to be a discussant. Thanks to Harsha, thanks to Dr. Chibber for asking me to do this. Uh, well, I am neither a trade economist nor an economist per se, but due to sheer observe, ob being having been an observer, I have some thoughts on the subject. Harsha has made a commendable presentation, a very comprehensive presentation. Uh, I would tend to agree with almost everything that he said but uh, would like to dwell maybe at a slightly deeper uh, stance on some of the issues that he has mentioned or may not have mentioned. Uh, first of all, uh, this whole di dimension of trade policy in the Indian context at many times seems to be a relatively disparate sort of a dimension. You know, we have a trade policy which was made in 2015 <clears throat> and uh, is continuing and the new trade policy would be coming in this, uh, at the end of this year. Uh, this policy should have uh, fin uh, completed its course in 2020, but because of COVID it was extended for a year and now the new policy should be coming out. Uh, all policies before 2015 have simply been a narration or an estimation of incentives on products. And you find very little of strategic thinking in uh, policy making as to how India would like to use trade opportunities for larger developmental process and how the developmental process, the industrial developmental process needs to align with trade policy and vice versa to derive the maximum benefit. Now, this has happened largely, and this is a point which uh, uh, we, we are mostly, most of all, uh, most of us are cognizant of the fact. Many of the reasons lie in the institutional format in which trade policy is made 
and trade policy is implemented. The most important thing is we have to recognize that almost 40% of the GDP is deriving out of international trade. And the moment you have recognized this, the whole dimension of relative importance of international trade takes completely different perspective. Now there is a realization, there is no doubt about that. The problem is this realization, and then at the same time, there is an extraordinary diversity in the political economic landscape and how to match these two, two, two aspects is an extremely challenging task. It becomes challenging by the day even more because of a variety of new challenges which are thrown in, whether it is the trade conflicts, whether it's the WTO's relative somnolence, whether it is uh, uh, the pandemic and the fact that for a long time, India's manufacturing has not really picked up. And it's only now that some recognition is there that because of some very decisive mandates which the government has made lately, there will be manufacturing pickup. But then again, this dimension is in the realm of uncertainty because as Harsha mentioned in his presentation, the tariff play, the non-tariff play are still very uncertain. First of all, raising tariffs does not necessarily mean that you will be able to produce well and produce competitive. The economy is likely to become costlier and therefore competitiveness globally is going to get affected. So therefore this concept <clears throat> that the domestic consumption alone perhaps is enough for India to be able to sustain its manufacturing is, in my opinion, slightly misplaced. And that's exactly what Harsha has said. Uh, it is not as if all sectors are covered in the same, uh, with the same brush. If you look at the pharmaceutical sector where a massive production lead incentive program has been launched, <clears throat> tariffs have not been increased on the APIs, the active pharmaceutical ingredients. Clearly recognizing the fact that India is in a very active manner contributing to global supplies. So there is this recognition that if you increase tariffs of inputs, you are going to make yourself more com um, uh, less competitive and therefore your market access is getting going to get. I think one of the major areas which may not have been said, uh, which is not in the realm of hard policy choices, but extremely, uh, but, but soft policy choices, but extremely important in India is the extreme diversity in terms of the governance of trade itself. And this is an institutional issue. First of all, uh, a territory which is implementing, making and implementing policies in 36 territories by itself is an extremely critical, ch uh, critical challenge. And these 36 states are organized in different levels of their sensitivity to the demands of international trade. Now, there are states which by their evolutionary history have become conscious of how sensitive, how important trade policies are for them. And therefore they would like to align their manufacturing policies with, their trade, uh, with, with the trade policy and therefore global markets would become the asking for them. But there are yet again the states which would still have, and, and mind you, this, this, kind of a, this kind of a layering of perceptions exists not just in states, but in the industry groups. Those, and those of us um, uh, who recall India's liberalization in 91 and uh, following thereafter are aware of the concept of Bombay Club in those days. And uh, so there are these, competing, uh, competing uh, forces which are working, those who would not like liberalization to take further liberalization to take place, and those who are ad taking advantage of the new evolution of the new developments and sitting at the, on the front end of technologies and so on and so forth, and therefore they would like to access global markets. So this sort of a political economic uh, balance, which is quite often, reason for India not coming head on 
with the kind of challenges which are thrown at it. RCEP was one of the reasons for RCEP not having been onboarded was this. Uh, there will be many such challenges which will be coming and Arsha mentioned about dairy, for example. Now, if EU negotiations are to start with, I think this is a big issue. What are we going to do with dairy? What are we going to do with agriculture? Tomorrow when we talk of the US, India trade relations, agriculture is a big issue. So there are these, these questions which are floating outside and India has to, has to decide on this. Why I mention this is, they may not appear to be policy, the parts of trade policy, but they are necessary for India's trade policy to move forward. Institutionally, whether you are talking of states, whether you are talking of industries, various, various levels of diversity, where you are, whether you are talking of uh, sectors. So that is one dimension. The second dimension, which again Harsha has touched upon, is the non-tariff measures. <clears throat> now, non-tariff measures, it's, it's, it's heartening to see that uh, uh, that uh, sorry, uh, the fact that India has at the moment relatively less coverage of non-tariff measures uh, is not really something which is which is a desirable thing in my perspective because there are two things coming out of it. One, the moment you don't have a entry technical architecture available, every pressure goes on to tariffs, and therefore tariffs tend to be played about. That is a fear. The second point is that if you don't adopt modern technical regulatory architecture, which is globally synchronized, then the question of quality and the question of high value add, how high value realization out of your exports is a big question. I think this is an issue which needs to be sorted out because one, a domestic producer would be very happy to see technical standards being implemented on a exporter or on, 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 a, on, a, on an imported product. But the moment when you tell him that this is national treatment and therefore you would also have to subscribe to standards, he would stand back. So, so obviously the protectionism contained in the aspect of technical regulations is what the technical standards are preferred for and not for the fact that they might get a greater value. So I think the challenges, I, I won't take more time, the challenges are many. Harsha has given in his presentation a very detailed sort of a technical architecture which needs to be addressed and is being addressed in a very significant manner. I think two or three challenges which government apparently at the moment is not adequately a clue to, one is the settling the political economy of trade and for which setting institutional processes and institutional platforms into, an, into a framework where the political econo and economic discourse can happen and resolutions can be made. Since that has not been done, there are situations like ASEP and there are which have happened in the past and may happen in future again. So I think that is one aspect. The second aspect is this whole dimension of regional trading. I think we have for too long tried to brush the issue under the carpet till it boiled out uh, when RCEP, uh, when India decided to uh, not uh, go on board RCEP. But I think the issue needs to be sorted out. The, the point which Harsha made very appropriately is the fear of exclusion. And I think this issue is not being adequately addressed. The fact that all your regional trading neighbors are part of some or the other FTA or will continue to be part of new FTAs and that you will be excluded is, some, is, is a fear which exists amongst the policymakers. But I think they have not been able to adequately address that fear. So, I'll stop here. There are many issues which can, which, which can be spoken about in addition to what uh, Harsha has said, but I don't like to take more time. I would just focus on these three or four issues. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rajiv. That was a marvelous discussion. I'll turn it over to Judy Dean. I want to thank James and Ajay for having me here today and uh, including me in this fascinating discussion. 
I also really want to thank Harsha for an amazingly comprehensive and insightful uh, review of both uh, past policies and India's progress on major changes in trade policy and the current state of affairs. I think this is fascinating. I'd like to start just by acknowledging that uh, there's been tremendous progress in India since 1991. I think no one can doubt this fact. Not only have we seen, uh, as Harsha pointed out, significant trade liberalization and accompanied by widespread domestic reforms, but we've also seen uh, amazing poverty reduction, strong growth in general for decades now. But the interesting thing to me is that manufacturing as a share of GDP has remained between about 15 and 17%, while the role of services in the economy has soared to approximately almost or just under 50% of GDP. So oddly enough, manufacturing, which we would think would be um, an area of great growth and uh, we would have expected to grow dramatically in the same period has really lagged. In light of that, I'm not surprised that India is focused a lot on trying to stimulate manufacturing. And in fact, Harsha highlighted uh, several key objectives that I'd like to focus on here. Uh, first of all, increasing domestic manufacturing and exports, increasing global value chain participation, and promoting foreign direct investment. I think these are all really important objectives. <clears throat> They're laudable. I think they would uh, each of these would contribute greatly to promoting uh, the growth of India's economy in the, both now and in the future. But as uh, Rajit just alluded to, I really believe there's a misalignment here between objectives and at least the current turn in trade policies that uh, Harsha described. So I'd like to focus on these three objectives and just mention a few reasons why I think this misalignment exists. Uh, first of all, uh, trade liberalization, not the reverse of that, <laughs> has actually promoted domestic manufacturing and exports. Secondly, open trade is really crucial for GBC participation. And finally, I don't think protectionism will solve the underlying impediments to foreign direct investment that India is experiencing. So I'd like to illustrate these three points with just a few bits of information. First of all, we have some really exciting evidence that uh, from the 1990s in particular, but also after that, that trade liberalization really has promoted Indian manufacturing in a dramatic way. Uh, some of you may be familiar with this, but others possibly not. Uh, work um, by Topalova and Kandalwal highlighted for us the amazing growth in total factor productivity of Indian firms during the 1990s after the great liberalization of 91. What's fascinating is that it came through two channels. Uh, one was increased access to imported intermediates, which actually stimulated uh, renewed uh, and higher TFP because firms could access higher quality inputs at lower costs. But they also saw increased competition through uh, reductions in tariffs on final products, on actual consumer goods and um, producer goods, uh, because the competition from abroad actually contributed to raising the firm's efficiency. So removing these barriers or reducing these barriers actually helped firms become more competitive. We also have work from Goldberg and co-authors that highlighted that during the same period, Indian manufacturing firms actually widened their scope of products. There was a big burst in the, the number of products produced by Indian firms. And a lot of this, uh, Goldberg and her co-authors estimate about a quarter of this growth in the scope of products being produced was stimulated because firms not only had increased access to imported intermediates in terms of varieties, but also because they could access new imported intermediates. So opening up whole new areas in which they could produce goods because of access to these new inputs. And finally, in more recent work, Arnold and co-authors uh, argue that there's evidence that manufacturing total factor productivity was stimulated even further 
by India's liberalization of its services. And this was especially true for uh, liberalization in banking, telecommunications, and transport. So interestingly enough, the importance of synergies between liberalizing services, both within the Indian economy, as well as, as, well as uh, liberalization of trade and services, uh, actually have big spillover effects on the productivity of manufacturing. So we have a lot of evidence here that it's more open markets that would actually help stimulate growth in India's manufacturing, not the reverse. The second point that open trade is crucial for G, uh, increased GBC participation. Uh, on the right here, I have a, a little graph borrowed from the OECD. This is the foreign value added content of gross exports, a common measure of uh, what's called backward participation in GBCs. And you can see the dark black line indicates um, the average uh, foreign value added content in India's uh, gross exports for 2005 to 2016. Uh, that ratio is about in the middle of the pack for the G20 countries, which is illustrated by that uh, blue shaded area. But as you can see, India's participation is falling in the recent years. Since about a high in 2012, you see a decline in India's GBC participation overall. And in manufacturing, if you had the data behind the chart, you can see in manufacturing, the fall is even more dramatic from a high of about 35% in 2012 to 23% in 2016. What I'd like to argue is that this goal of increased GBC participation is really important, I think, for India. It has significant benefits, many of which are high priorities, as Harsha has pointed out, and yet the policies that India seems to be choosing now uh, seems to go completely counter to what's needed to accomplish this goal. So uh, some of the benefits I've listed here, but I'd like to highlight just a few. One is uh, India's interest in increasing exports. Uh, GVCs are well known for being a great avenue to increase both direct exports to the rest of the world by actually participating in the chain directly but also by increasing indirect exports, by stimulating local suppliers to be within the economy, to be suppliers to a chain, even if they're not actually part of the chain directly. Uh, India's interest in stimulating FDI inflow could also be helped by GBC participation since, as in China, much of investment is also, in, or participation in GBCs is also accompanied by for an investment by lead firms and other players in, in the chain. Uh, also, uh, reducing risk and promoting resilience, particularly in these last few years, has been a, a key goal, especially during the pandemic. There's a lot of evidence now that firms that have global supply chains and have been participating in them for many years find that their supply chains are actually more resilient, even to things like a global pandemic than they would have been had most of the chain been domestic. So there are a lot of great benefits from participation, but some of the crucial policies in order to both encourage Indian firms to be able to be ready to join chains and also to encourage lead firms to actually look to Indian firms to be part of their chains, include things like liberalizing trade to expand access to destination markets for what the firms produce, but also to expand access to imported inputs, a key element of participating in a chain. Uh, also uh, improving logistics and infrastructure, uh, which is important in particular because as Harsha just pointed out, India still ranks very poorly when it comes to uh, services, uh, trade and services and restrictions on those services, uh, particularly in things like logistics, air transport, uh, crucial elements for success in a GBC. Another key factor would be reducing trade costs. While we see that India has worked hard with trade facilitation improvement, as Harsha pointed out, uh, maintaining high trade barriers is certainly not going to contribute to reducing trade costs. So this is just going to work against the goal of GVC participation. 
Finally, I'd like to highlight uh, some issues with FDI, which I find fascinating, but also puzzling. So I'll raise some questions here. Uh, I don't think protectionism will do anything to help us encourage FDI, but particularly, I don't think it's going to solve underlying impediments that seems to still persist over a couple of decades at least. I dug into some of the details here of foreign direct investment um, using the information from the official Indian website. And what I found was uh, the cumulative FDI equity inflows from for the last 20 years or so, April 2000 to June 2020, you can see are concentrated in five sectors. This is about five out of roughly 40 or 50 sectors that, the, uh, that are listed. Nearly half this FDI inflow has gone to service sectors, computer hardware, telecoms, uh, domestic trading, and construction. I think what you should see here is the absence of manufacturing. While there is FDI throughout manufacturing sectors, the percentages that go to those sectors are tiny, even over 20 years, well below 5% in most of the sectors in many below 1%. So something is causing FDI inflows to concentrate heavily in services and not really broadly in manufacturing. The other thing I found, and this uh, is uh, the pie chart shows data for just uh, one quarter of 2019 to 2020. Uh, however, looking back in time, I found the same concentration across states. So here in this more, relatively recent data, you can see percentage of FDI equity inflows, uh, where they are hosted, in which states do they go. Six states account for 86% of that FDI. So we're seeing concentrations not only across services and not widespread inflow into manufacturing, but we're also seeing it concentrated in just a few states. Now I went back five years and I went back another five, at least 10 years back in time and these FDI equity inflows across states still remain concentrated in about four, five, five to six states. Oftentimes the same ones you see on my screen. That leads me to ask, what is causing this lack of FDI more broadly in manufacturing and why aren't most more states hosting FDI? That suggests to me that there's some kind of internal impediments going on here, of which trade policy will not address, <laughs> will not solve. Um, Arvind Panagaria very famously highlighted some of these uh, in his book back in 2008, talking about the rigidities in state labor laws and small scale reservation policies at the time, which really worked against uh, interaction of FDI. So I wonder, uh, are these, sector specific incentives such as the PLI scheme and other schemes that have been uh, uh, occurring uh, since say 2014, the make in India, et cetera. Are we seeing a resurgence of sort of sector specific incentives which would tend to actually work against FDI being attracted by creating distortions in the economy? Could so that you be- 14 minutes? I only need about one second. Got it. Uh, and then lastly, uh, are some of, lar of the larger policies related to FDI and trade potentially going to uh, uh, weakening or impeding FDI inflows, particularly the 2018 reforms to the BIT, India's BITs, which seem to weaken uh, investors' rights relative to the state and then high tariffs that clearly weaken any incentives uh, FDI has to come in via GVCs. So I'll leave it there with those few questions. Thank you. Great questions. Thank you so much, Judy, um, for your granular discussion of trade in India and policy recommendations. Okay, let's finish up with uh, Dean Alyssa Ayers. The floor is yours. Thank you. And what a great conversation uh, this morning with incredibly uh, detailed data to back up all the observations. 
Uh, none of us coordinated ahead of time. Uh, and so I'm going to skip over uh, some parts of what I'd plan to say, particularly uh, on the question of how India's current trade policies uh, do not appear to be enhancing the longstanding goal across various governments to increase the percentage of manufacturing um, contributing to India's overall GDP. This, this is actually a really important policy goal. And I wanna just repeat the fact that successive Indian governments from the UPA that created the national manufacturing uh, policy through the Modi government's Make in India initiative, uh, this focus on increasing manufacturing has been a really big piece of India's larger economic goals because the desire has been to, to create jobs Right. Look at India's demographics. This umbrella goal, public policy goal, has been uh, for, I guess, 15 years now, 16 years now, since 2005, uh, to find a way to, have, to spur job creation, particularly at, at um, a very large scale parts of the economy. And as everyone here knows, uh, there's been tremendous growth in the services sector. Um, tremendous growth in the uh, IT, IT enabled services sector, which does not create the numbers of jobs that manufacturing could potentially create. Uh, and I think some of what you've seen in the conversation this morning or this evening, depending on where you're joining from, uh, gets back to the question of trade policy. Um, can India continue with its current trade policy and achieve this goal of job creation uh, and, and growing the manufacturing sector. I mean, I, I think Professor Dean's um, response here suggests that that may not be possible. And I think what we saw from the initial presentation by Dr. Singh, and I was really struck by uh, Dr. Singh's kind of ending observation that FTA engagement looking ahead is not going to be easy. Why is it not going to be easy? Uh, because India is beginning its negotiating stance from a, a very different level of tariffs than its competitor economies or the economies that may be interested in entering into trade agreements with India. And so that's going to continue tensions. Um, for India, this question of growing the economy to continue uh, uh, creating that broad base that can allow India to fulfill uh, the important domestic policy goals, ensuring its defense, ensuring defense modernization. This has, again, been a longstanding policy goal. Having a robust economy is the basis for that strength. Um, these are questions that I think remain open. There is a global governance question um, that is uh, just as important, and that has to do with the fact that uh, although India is now a very large economy, one of the world's largest economies, as we saw from Dr. Singh's presentation, uh, it is not a member of the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum, APEC, you would think that it would be. Uh, every time uh, questions come up, I, I certainly have, have in my own work advocated for Indian membership in APEC, um, but you hear over and over again from the member economies that it's so difficult to contemplate uh, Indian membership, given the fact that India is not a fully open economy in the same way that the existing members are. And that uh, for a, a, an organization that governs by consensus, uh, it would be difficult to think about uh, that membership. What could it look like? But for for, for when you look at a world uh, in which one of the world's largest economies is not part of an organization that, um, uh, while it does not take binding decisions, it helps shape the dialogue and helps shape the direction of, of trade opening, trade facilitation, green goods. I mean, the direction that trade and investment conversations go, particularly across uh, the Indo Pacific, is one that, uh, uh, you know, the APEC. Uh, conversations help shape. So that's a question, global governance. You could make the same argument also about the OECD. Of course, OECD membership is important for uh, International Energy Agency membership. India is not a member of either, although it is a, a, a crucially important uh, energy purchaser on the world economy. Um, these governance questions, I think, are getting in some cases stuck with the idea of India not being as open of an economy, therefore not uh, ready to participate in conversations in organizations that are focused on uh, open trade and, and open engagement. Um, 
let me skip uh, very briefly because I, I am trying to keep, uh, I guess, under seven minutes here. Uh, the U.S.-India trade relationship is a challenging one. And we have not uh, been able to even negotiate a bilateral investment treaty, uh, despite a declared desire to do so. But each country took turns uh, revising its own model, but we are now very, very far apart. A bit would typically be a kind of first process, a first chapter uh, of an eventual FTA negotiation, but we're very far away even from getting to somewhere on a bit. So it's very difficult to imagine how an FTA negotiation would even begin. During the Trump administration, I think everybody here is familiar with the fact that the trade discussion between India and the United States became even more tense, first with the Trump administration's Section 232 tariffs and then India's retaliatory tariffs that hit a number of uh, US agricultural exports, uh, including pulses, a uh, very high tariff increase on pulses. Uh, India is one of the world's largest pulse purchasing markets. Um, but but it, you know, how do you get to yes on some of these trade issues if the Indian perspective on trade is one that does not see increased openness as something that's inherently beneficial and inherently uh, powerful for India's own growth and ability to deliver on its own priorities on the world stage. I think that remains an open question. We're seeing some of these same issues occur uh, in the new digital trade arena, whether it's questions of data localization or access to information or some of the freedom of expression issues that are also coming up related to that. Uh, agricultural trade remains very difficult in, you know, you can take any kind of arena in which India is a major uh, uh, market and you'll find a whole bunch of very tough and um, uh, long-standing agricultural issues, whether it's the presence of weed seeds in tons of wheat or issues about dairy having to do with the diet that cows have eaten their entire lives. I mean, these are actually very difficult to overcome. And some of these issues have been around for two decades or longer. Um, so uh, although the US-India trade relationship has increased admirably over the last two decades, it's far below both countries' stated goals of trying to get to 500 billion dollars into a trade in goods and services. Uh, and it's a little bit hard to see uh, the pathway to getting to that declared goal under present circumstances. Um, so let me just stop there. What a great and very detailed conversation. Um, and Dr. Singh, thank you for that PowerPoint, which really did wrap up a lot of important data all together in one narrative. Thank you. Dean Aris, thank you so much for your final comments on, well, actually, uh, US, in particular, US-India trade relationship, a very important one. Uh, I, I want to now turn it over to the audience to pop in their questions, raise your hands, however you would like to let me know what you would like in the chat. Um, but I'll turn it back to um, uh, Harsha Singh for uh, response to the discussions right now. So uh, I, I respond before the participants' questions, uh, is it? You want me to respond now? Absolutely. Okay. You get Thank your you. chance. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I uh, <clears throat> try to actually summarize a lot of what's uh, underneath. Uh, so uh, a lot of detail into some kind of simplified uh, 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 statements. Uh, the discussants has, have pointed out a number of uh, aspects. Uh, uh, Rajiv Kher uh, uh, touched upon uh, disparate efforts, uh, little strategic thinking, uh, how in certain sectors actually which are being promoted, tariffs have not been increased, uh, extreme diversity, so the center state differences plus across state differences. Uh, NTMs, uh, NTMs, the architecture is good because it paves the way for more sophisticated kind of uh, production uh, mechanisms and, and structures. And the political economy of trade institutions where discussions can take place. So these are all very important points. 
in terms of policies, one of the things which uh, the discussion of policy gets lost by is the fact that India's tariffs have gone up quite significantly in the last two years. Actually, India's other than the tariff area and a focus on increasing tariffs for uh, uh, and, uh, attracting FDI, India's actually made a very large number of very good policy decisions. And it continues to focus on that. The problem, as I see, is that when we look at policy, we then start thinking of what is the impact of that policy, and we don't see the implementation mechanism. We don't see the system in place, the strategic aspects which Rajiv talked about. So we did a major project, and Rajiv was part of that, on uh, the difficulties faced by India's own exports due to India's domestic policies. And the interesting thing is, if you try and see several policy areas which India has tried to improve, it's a very impressive list. When you see, okay, what needs to be improved, the list continues to be including those where India has actually improved the policies because the list includes the aspirations of industry, which is a reflection of what's actually happening on the ground. And that's where the process of coordination and ensuring that the policies are actually effectively implemented to get rid of the obstacles becomes important. And a, a notable point in this context is that India has actually started with a major initiative on, on, on uh, this by looking at specific actions in the implementation process under the uh, uh, a committee which oversees all this under the cabinet secretary. So it's not as if India is not making the effort. India has made a lot of effort, but in trade policy terms, we are diverted by two or three uh, recent uh, uh, directions of policy. One is high uh, tariffs. One is increasingly more difficult application of NTMs, which is true. So India has become an NTM regime more protectionist. And the other is the fact that India did not get into RCEP and it got out of it at the last minute. So the reality is somewhere in between. The policies, a number of, as I said, there's a lot of reform inside the border. So, and that is, uh, that is the area which will cover uh, uh, several points which have been made. Second, when you look at the evidence, India has seen that the protection given to its auto sector has actually led to a large auto sector coming up, plus, a very significant presence in global markets also. Uh, so, you know, that, that's something which, which India considers, oh, this is an important kind of poli uh, uh, industrial policy to follow. How do we replicate this? Similarly, as, as far as PLI is concerned, every country, every you just go to any country which has succeeded, they have followed subsidization. They have followed support to specific sectors, be it China, be it US, be it Europe, be it Vietnam. So PLI is a result of very well examined as, uh, uh, assess, uh, uh, an assessment made of how others are actually making their policies. So PLI, the policy has come out, the reaction in terms of investment in large electronics, for example, far surpassed the expectations, but how has it been implemented becomes important. And that's where uh, something which, uh, that's, that's maybe for another discussion, but I'll just give you an example. There was another subsidy scheme, MSIPS, which was a subsidy to capital investment. And if you see this disbursement of subsidies, it was very, very poor. And it was both due to administrative reasons, because of questions asked to those who make the decisions, the coordination between different ministries. 
India is also trying to facilitate in a big way where now it is introducing through digital uh, assessment uh, randomly uh, customs officers so that the relationships don't come up and uh, uh, develop some kind of uh, uh, barriers, et cetera. So, but when you bring in these changes, you should also try and do an assessment of how is it being implemented. India is very poor on that. And it's there that uh, its trade has performed much worse than what it could. When the initial opening up, when the uh, you see the kind of uh, trade uh, performance after 91 in the first decade of 2000, India did very well, as I showed you. After that, it stuck. And when you look at that, several of the, the points which Rajiv made become crucial. If you uh, then, uh, if you go to Judy, she pointed out the importance of certain states. And that links up with what Rajiv said. But even these states, if you take a look, there are situations where policies abruptly changed or the uh, agreement between one existing government and the next one is not honored. So there, the, it's not just good policy, it's stability and predictability of policy, which is very important. And that is where a strong governance mechanism of China and Vietnam came in handy. China is not as predictable as, say, Vietnam would be, but at least China makes very clear for a period of time the contours of policies that will be predictable. It goes very actively to precisely the firms which it wants to connect with. Global value chains, actually, if you take a look at the, the numbers of global value chain participation of India and China, they are very similar. They are very, very similar. The difference is that China's global value chain participation is of a different nature because not only why it did decrease its uh, value chain participation, which means that its domestic contribution to the value chain has gone up. Uh, uh, so because participation is what is the share of imports in your total exports kind of thing. Uh, but the, then there is an estimation of what happens to your exports and how much are they incorporated in products which are then exported again. So not only three borders, but a fourth border. There, China is much better. Why? Because China has focused on increasing its capabilities, its technology. It, it, uh, when, uh, uh, if you talk to China and the economic zones, which, are, uh, which China ran, one of the criteria and the pride of uh, this, this entire operation is, oh, we got so many of the global top 500 firms to invest here, 200 of them. Similarly, you see how many global 500 have emerged in China and how many have emerged in India. It's a very clear strategy is trying to follow that, but Vietnam is a very different economy. So it's for taking whatever it can pick up. But many of these things which India has tried to pick up, even if it is implementing it properly, uh, it is uh, uh, changing policy, it's not implementing it properly. That is very uh, uh, difficult and different scenario. Second, I talked about conceptualization of a policy change. So if, for example, I, from uh, uh, one ministry, suggest a particular policy, but another ministry just stops it for its own uh, kind of uh, limited perspective. So the coordination of objectives. One of the points which Rajiv keeps making, and this is something which uh, I was thinking he might touch upon is, that exports or trade is not, he did make the point of trade not being seen as a larger point, but it should, when you come out with foreign trade policy, it should be agreed and announced by the cabinet, 
not by commerce ministry. So when the cabinet announcement comes, it is the government's objective. When commerce ministry does it, it is one ministry's objective. And there are multiple ministries. Implementation is a different ball game depending on how you, you, you manage these things. Much more thought- Prashant, I want to jump in just for a yeah. second and tell you we're about four minutes over. Uh, I oh, want to make an executive very decision. Quickly, just... uh, very quickly then, on yeah. FTAs, I think China is a, is a special concern because FTAs is a, is a large uh, uh, issue. But India wants to be very focused with EU. It's going to be difficult. But India has agreed, like the uh, BTI, BITs, India has actually agreed to negotiate an investment agreement with, with the EU. So things are not rigid depending on which objective is being emphasized. So India is trying to open up. Its system is not really geared towards it. The domestic political economy is such that the steps required to manage that uh, 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 require transition. That's what I meant. That, And I also feel that many areas in US, India, FTA, can be managed provided we just change the approach, approach both towards India and by US. US comes out with, a, with a, a very many offensive interests, but if you try and see what was allowed to Japan in the area of, of rice, if similar kind of things are handled with India, I think there is a possibility of incremental change in perspectives. And this is the same country which didn't want services in the, the WTO gag and today is emphasizing services. So my, the, the, the reasons for not making policy change are deeper than just policy. And the policies which are being announced are far more efficient or effective in various parts, including FDI, but the implementation is, is still lacking. And third, India actually wants to link up with the world. Its MFN tariffs are a, a problem, but it can be managed through uh, mutually satisfactory solutions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Arsha. Actually, we're, we're over by quite a bit, but I'll take it uh, to the 10 minute mark with uh, just a brief comment and a couple of questions, overview, quick questions to you. First of all, regards to, to you from your student, Intermit Gill. Who had to leave? Oh, he uh, was he never course... my student. He was. He was. We studied together. He. He, he ah! was a, a junior at college. He claims. So... He yes. claims you were his student. I mean, he was uh, your student because no, no, he learned no, no. income and substitution from you, and that's all he needed. <laughs> but uh, anyway, going on, I just yeah. wanted to mention two points that were mentioned in the chat. We'll have to leave the rest of them uh, to be handled uh, by email. But uh, first, what about autom automation in manufacturing? This is yeah. a key issue. And also, if a, pro if a policy really can't be implemented, why is India taking the policy? Why not just give it up? And we'll finish with those two questions and then uh, bring those it to a close questions. in three minutes. Yes. Thank you. Automation is actually a major uh, uh, issue. And you know it was pointed out that jobs is a, is a very important objective. And if you see the manufacturing, uh, uh, emphasis on manufacturing, it's uh, data suggests that actually employment in manufacturing has gone down while the production has sort of maintained itself. And that's due to automation. Uh, that is an area which combined with new technologies, which I pointed out, which will change the, the, the operational environment completely. Uh, is something which policymakers are trying to handle, but I don't think people are giving it the kind of attention which is needed. So uh, automation is definitely an area to look at. The future of jobs becomes very important also in that context. There is thinking going on, but some way to go. On why does India implement policy? Because India has actually seen the impact of good policy. And India recognizes that the way out is good policy. And even the current emphasis on high tariffs, in some, I, I have been thinking, how is this different from our import substitution era? To India, this, I've, I've not, not been the policymaker in this context, but if I want to, to try and guess and put myself in the shoes of the policymaker, this is the time when the domestic market of India is in their minds very attractive. 
and they feel that the fact that FDI, I showed you the data on increasing FDI. FDI comes in, especially in certain key areas, strategic areas, and it comes in with an, uh, a possibility of uh, staying, linking up with domestic production. And also, since these are large players, they also have access to global markets. The various other uh, kind of objectives will follow. There's a very key point which was made, which is the conflict between policies and objectives. Uh, Timbergen was given the Nobel Prize for finding out, for suggesting that uh, as many uh, uh, instruments, as, as, uh, you know, as many uh, objectives you have, you need that many instruments. And there are policies which work against certain objectives. That is not clearly recognized because of the emphasis on certain objectives, while there is talk or uh, uh, emphasis on certain others, but perhaps there is a timeline in mind that first we do this, then we'll manage that. But I, I suspect the world is changing in such a rapid way. Technological change is coming in such a rapid way that you can't have large conflicts in place. And one of the things, that's why I said, I hope India's tariff policy, if it comes in, because the second best world is, okay, you bring in tariffs, but you uh, uh, actually, if, if you actually not deviate from bringing in tariffs, at least do it at, in a temporary way. Recognize the fact that it adversely affects competitiveness. And that, that is something which, if that uh, understanding comes into the major policy makers, then I think we are home. And if we are in the second best world in any case. Indeed we are. Well, thank you so much for your extensive comments that were wonderful and to our audience for, uh, for giving uh, such a great uh, series of questions in the chat. We'll be back to you. Um, thanks everyone for being here.